Okay. So the bacteria, when infected with foreign DNA from the virus, um, have some internal defenses. Um, and so when a, fi a phage um, infects a bacterial colony, it can wipe out an entire bacterial colony. So what happens is um, natural selection favors bacterial mutants with receptor sites that are not recognized by phages. So what does that mean? So if you have, we have bacteria here, and they have these receptor sites that, remember that's how the virus knows, and that's why they can only infect certain cells. And so if you have viruses that have these receptor sites, if a mutation occurs in one of these viruses, so let, or one of these bacteria. So let's say a mutation occurs in the DNA and it doesn't, the mutation means that uh, it doesn't make this receptor protein. So this is um, a mutant and it has no receptor proteins for the virus. And that's a random mutation. So the, um, what happens is, is if the virus comes to infect, this it can infect this bacteria cell, it can infect this one, this one, but it cannot infect this one. So therefore, what's going to happen to this one? It will survive, and when it survives, it's going to reproduce, and then you're going to have more and more mutant ones, and all the ones with the receptors um, die. And therefore, we would say that this bacterial population has evolved, it's changed, it has different traits in it than it did before. And so, that's one way that bacteria can survive. Um, let's talk about the um, uh, internally what can happen. So bacteria can produce restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes that cu um, cut up foreign DNA, including phage DNA. And so, um, <coughs> so what happens when the virus does infect the cell? So let's say one of these right here has the right receptor cell of receptor protein. And the virus then is able to infect it. So here's the virus, and it inserts its DNA. Uh, a normal defense for bacteria is they produce enzymes. And what the enzymes, these restriction enzymes do, is they cut up the foreign DNA. So therefore, when the virus inserts its DNA, it cuts it up, and therefore, the viral DNA has no effect on the cell, and then the viruses won't reproduce. Um, so they have these restriction enzymes as well. That's another uh, mechanism of defense. So what happens is natural selection favors the viruses that are mutated, that are resistant to the restriction enzyme. So what happens is if a, viruses can also mutate, their, and their DNA can also mutate, if a virus infects um, a bacteria and the enzyme it's, it's, uh, it has no effect against that virus, then that virus's DNA doesn't get chopped up, and that virus can actually reproduce and so on. So that would be a good uh, mutation for the viruses. Um, and so if they're, re if they're resistant to restriction enzymes, remember all of that is um, random, these mutations. Okay, so that is the bacteriophages, the viruses that infect bacteria. We're gonna look now at viruses that infect us, all right? So the, the, what we've talked about so far, those would not infect our cells. So uh, the viruses that infect our cells have envelopes around them. They're called envelope viruses. They have an outer envelope and use it to enter the host cell. So the envelope fuses with the host membrane, moving the capsid and viral genome inside the cell. After the virus assembles, it buds from the host cell. I'll show you this in the picture in just a second here. The viral envelope is thus derived from the host's plasma membrane. These enveloped viruses do not necessarily kill the host cell, um, and so the host cell may stay alive uh, over time. And so, Example, um, the herpes virus is an envelope virus. 
Um, in some cases, copies of the DNA from the herpes virus, um, which includes chicken pox. There are different types of, there's a whole family of this under the umbrella of herpes virus. Um, there is the herpes virus that causes genital herpes. There's the herpes virus that causes cold sores. And there's a form of it that causes chicken pox. Uh, and so I want to talk a minute about that here. Um, what happens is, we're going to look at the chicken pox one, remains behind as many chromosomes in the nuclei of certain nerve cells. So copies of the DNA. Uh, so when you get the chicken pox, you've been um, infected with the, this virus. This virus uses you know, your cells to replicate more viruses. But what it does in the meantime, is during that process, is take some of its viral DNA and actually inserts it and keeps it into your cells as this little mini chromosome, all right? That's what that means in, the, in your nucleus. And it stays there. So you have this, so once you're infected with the chickenpox virus, you've got this viral DNA in your, your cells for the rest of your life, all right? And so then what happens is certain environmental things like stress, um, physical, emotional stress, what that can do is trigger your cells to start um, going through protein synthesis and making more viruses from that because you have the viral DNA still in your cells. And that manifests itself not as chicken pox, but as shingles, all right? So, um, so there they remain um, for life until triggered by, um, the DNA stays for life until triggered by emotional or physical stress and we get um, shingles as an example. And so, um, you guys have heard of shingles. Have you heard that, um, you have to have had chicken pox to have shingles, and that's the reason why, okay? Uh, so that's the reason why. So now they have a vaccine against chicken pox. When I was younger, they didn't have a vaccine against chicken pox, but um, most of you probably have had the vaccination against chicken pox, all right? So um, therefore, you most likely will never get shingles, all right? So the vaccination do that? No, the vaccination, because they take out the, the DNA part that it causes the, yeah. All right, so here we have this picture that shows you how an envelope virus uh, infects the host cell. So here, let's look at this. Here you have the capsid, and, which is protein. Everything in purple here is protein. So the capsid with the RNA and the envelope around it. There's two things that are new about this type of virus. Um, the first thing is that it has the envelope around it, and the second thing is its genetic material. This virus here in this picture, the genetic material is RNA, not DNA. And so that poses some other issues as well that makes things a little bit differently. All right, so we're gonna look at both of those things. So the, the envelope, the purpose of the envelope is allow it, it allows the virus to bind to the host cell. Remember the host cell has receptors, right? What this picture is not showing you is how, notice here, the capsid all of a sudden is inside the host cell. So how in the world does the capsid get inside the host cell? These, these are called glycoproteins. These proteins bind to receptors on the cell. And so if this is the cell membrane and this is the, the membrane around the virus, it goes like this and fuses with the cell membrane. And so the capsid, that was around here with the RNA, now can enter the cell. So it's kind of like what process? Endocytosis, endocytosis. So it comes in and now you have the capsid. Another thing that this picture is not showing you is from here to here, here's the RNA, this is the RNA here, that the capsid breaks up or breaks down. So in the previous picture, you had little kind of parts there of the capsid, so it breaks down. So that exposes your viral genome, which is RNA. <clears throat> so here's your viral genome, and this is RNA. So I'm gonna color code this and um, and actually go through and add some bases here. So this is a single stranded piece of RNA. So it's made out of RNA nucleotides that have different bases. So let's say it's A, U, C, and G. 
All right, and so obviously it would be many more bases long, but I'm just gonna use that example. So what happens is, remember, to make new viruses, because that's the whole goal is of the infection, why the virus is infecting the host cell is to make new viruses. How do we make new viruses? We have to replicate the genetic material and replicate the proteins, all right, or make new proteins. So, so what they do with the RNA, all right, so this is, this one right here is this, so it's the A, U, C, G. Notice here it says this original RNA uh, genetic material is a template. What does that mean? It's going to be used to make more RNA. And so, let me get a different color here. So, let me use blue here. So this right here is your new RNA. And so, so there's an enzyme. What enzyme do we use to make RNA? Yeah, R and so if this is done by so this uh, this is a complementary. I'm gonna do it in orange. This is a complementary. RNA strand made by RNA polymerase. And that usually comes from the, the, the virus themselves. All right, so then, so it makes a complementary strand. So what would be the order of the basis for the complementary strand? UAGC. So that would be your complementary strand. So then over here, some of that complement, so some of the complementary strands come over here and are used to make proteins. So this is going to be acting as an mRNA and it's, this is used to make viral proteins. And that's why we have two uh, arrows here. What are the viral proteins? Well, let's look at the original virus. There's proteins that make up the capsid and there's proteins around the envelope. So right here, that's gonna be used to make the capsid protein. We go in this direction. Notice here, it's gonna make these things called glycoproteins, but look at here, this says ER, and realistically, it's the rough ER. Rough ER has what on it? Ribosome. So here's the ribosome. Remember, when the mRNA goes to the ribosome, it reads the mRNA in groups of three, the codons, adding amino acids. So what's going to happen is um, when the mRNA comes to that ribosome, it's going to start hooking one amino acid to another and so on and building a polypeptide chain. That protein actually attaches to the inside membrane, inside of the membrane of the rough ER. All right, and so that the, this part right here, all of these, these are glycoproteins that are the same as the glycoproteins on the outside of your virus. All right, so we use part of the RNA to make your proteins. I'm gonna come back to this in just a second. The second use of the RNA is to make more RNA because you have to, to make more viruses, we have to copy it. So let's start here with the red. So here's your Sorry, the, the blue. So this little guy here, some of that is used over here, UAGC. And the RNA polymerase then uses that to make a complementary strand. What do you notice about this copy of the RNA compared to the original RNA in the virus? It's exactly the same. So now, what? see how this is the same as what originally came in. And so this now, this is that same RNA with the A, U, C, G. The, and this can be used many times to make many copies. The capsid proteins that were made over here surround the RNA. Now notice here the capsid comes and is leaving through what process? 
Exocytosis. But notice here, notice what's on the outside here is these glycoproteins. So why are they on the outside? Let's go back over here. Remember these proteins that were made? Remember when we talked about the rough ER when it makes proteins? Do you remember that a part of it pinches off and you get a transport vesicle? Do you remember that? Yes. The inside of the transport vesicle has, whoops, wrong color, has these glycoproteins. What does the transport vesicle do? It comes and binds, kind of like exocytosis. This isn't showing you this, that they're, they're connected. These are supposed to be connected to the membrane. That was one of the things when I transferred from PowerPoint to Google Slides and screwed up here. All right, these are attached to the membrane. So the outside membrane of the host cell now has these glycoproteins so that when the virus now buds off, you have a virus that's exactly like the original virus, all right? So what in this process is different with viruses that maintain the same like kind of code for their entire existence, like smallpox, that haven't mutated unless we can find a vaccine versus like viruses that mutate all the time, like the flu virus that we can't find a vaccine for because they just... Well, we do find vaccines for, well, yeah, but, but we, we didn't change it. Yeah, keep changing it versus like a virus that would never change like smallpox. Right. Um, they found that RNA viruses as a whole, um, one of the things that they lack is, because there are some other things that come in, there, that does have, some of the viruses come with their own RNA polymerase and things like that. They do have some of the mechanisms, but they lack um, enzymes that um, uh, repair. So when you have mismatches or just natural uh, mistakes, in the replication process, they don't get fixed. And because they don't have those, just a whole class of RNA viruses as a whole, you see more mutation rates in those than like you do in the DNA viruses. All right, as a result. So it has to do with what is contained in the virus. All right. Okay. All right, so that's your, so this was an envelope virus, that picture, but also showed you an RNA virus. So, so that picture that we just looked at, RNA was the genetic material. But we're gonna look at another type of RNA virus called a retrovirus. That's the most complicated life cycle of all the viruses. Um, what's unique about retroviruses is that they have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that transcribes DNA from an RNA template. So it's able to take RNA and make <coughs> DNA. So they call it reverse transcriptase because it's the opposite of transcription. Transcription in our cells, we usually take DNA and make mRNA, right? So this is exactly the opposite. So that makes these viruses unique. Um, HIV is an example of a retrovirus. So I'm gonna have you write this because I didn't put, I, I, for some reason when I copied and pasted it didn't get onto your sheet. RNA viruses as a whole lack replication error check in, checking mechanisms and thus have higher rates of mutation. Which kind of is like you were reading my mind. Um, than other viruses. So they lack replication error checking mechanisms and thus have higher rates of mutation. So the HIV virus falls into that category because it's an RNA virus. Why it wouldn't combine with the 
Yeah, I'm just trying to understand why why people number one even like think that, and then number two why it's not true. Well, yeah, you'd have to. There would have to be several mutations, probably because the the likelihood of all several random mutations that would occur, because the HIV virus and the flu virus are not going to come together yeah. to like, they're different. you know, yeah. Well, and yes, they're not going. They don't. Viruses don't go from one virus to another exchange. Yeah information. So therefore, for the HIV to totally change its whole mode of infection, you would have multiple random mutations that would need to happen. Yeah. So I would imagine that the likelihood of all of that it's happening together, yeah. you know, and one is probably like this. All right. All right. So HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is a retrovirus. Uh, we've learned about this when we did the immune system attacks. Remember your white blood cells of your immune system. It weakens the immune system so that people that develop AIDS, um, it's difficult to fight off the infection. And um, people with healthy immune systems, um, it, uh, you know, these infections are easily combated with a healthy immune system, but with a com uh, compromised immune system because of the HIV virus, um, people can die of other things that nor that people who have a healthy immune system don't. All right, so they can be life-threatening with somebody with AIDS. So let's look at how the HIV as, as an example of a retrovirus works. So the beginning part of this is exactly like we just looked at. So HIV has an envelope, and so it's showing you, it's entering the, the capsid is coming in through exocyto or endocytosis. The capsid is breaking down. And HIV, the genetic material, is RNA, and it also comes with reverse transcriptase. And this is a typo here. It says reverse transcriptase. It should be ACE. That's what this little guy here is. <clears throat> so here's your viral RNA. So what happens is, in this viral RNA, so I'm going to use the same sequence that I did before. So let's say it's A U C G. What reverse transcriptase does, as we just learned, is the opposite of transcription. So it takes the viral RNA and moves along the viral RNA and makes a complementary DNA strand. So the complementary DNA strand, so this is the DNA. This was the original RNA. So that's why it says the DNA-RNA hybrid. So the complementary strand, what would the, the order of basis for DNA would be if the RNA was A, U, C, G? Yeah, it would be a T, because DNA doesn't have U's, remember? T, A, G, C. So it makes a complementary DNA strand. So. This is complementary, meaning it has the opposite basis to the viral RNA. Then look what happens. It takes this DNA, so here's the original DNA here, T-A-G-C, and look at it, it makes a second DNA strand. So, it, uh, it's kind of like DNA replication. It makes a complementary DNA strand. So what would be? It would be A, T, C, G. So now it makes, now we have a double-stranded DNA. And, and that's exactly what we have in our, our, our DNA. Our DNA is double-stranded. So what this does is the fact that this virus has this reverse transcriptase, it allows it to make DNA that can then, look at what happens to it. It can be inserted into our chromosome. So they call it a provirus. This is the viral DNA. Um, inserted into the chromosome. 
So people who have been affected, infected with the HIV virus, this is what has happened to their cells. So, so the virus made a complementary DNA strand that has the complementary bases of their viral RNA. What that does, the order of these bases contains instructions to make new viral proteins. And so people who have been infected with HIV for the life of this cell, they now have the HIV DNA in their chromosomes, all right, forever. And so what that allows the cell to do, and this is why it's beneficial for the virus, is this cell keeps living, and this cell then at any time can make mRNA and go through protein synthesis. So therefore it makes mRNA, it makes the protein, so there's the capsid proteins, there's those glycoproteins that we just talked about. The, um, the RNA then also is used for the viral, uh, the, the um, genetic material for the next cells, because remember the virus has um, RNA as the genetic material. So some of the RNA becomes the genetic material, some goes to make proteins. So we can write that here. So some, all right, I put here some um, RNA becomes the RNA genome for the next viral generation. Some RNA is used to make viral proteins. And so then what happens is the viral proteins surround the genetic material and leaves through exocytosis and it gets an envelope and what you end up with is a new HIV virus that's identical to this virus. All right, then, all right, so it allows you to replicate. And so you can do this and replicate and make many viruses. Notice that what this allows is this host cell doesn't die, so the host cell stays alive, which is a good thing for the virus because, this, the, because they inserted the DNA, this host cell can continue they make new HIV viruses, all right? And so we're gonna see, uh, I'll talk about in just a second, I'll show you some examples, but some of um, the treatments for people who have been infected with HIV, like antibiotics don't work against viruses. We don't really have medicine that attack the viruses directly. Um, like when you have a viral infection, you, uh, you can take medicine to treat your symptoms to make you feel better, but your own body's immune system has to fight that virus over time. And so for people with HIV, they've come up with antiviral drugs, they call them. Um, these antiviral drugs, what they do is interfere with the replication process. So, uh, so uh, some, one of them is called AZT. What it does is it interferes with reverse transcriptase. So what happens is, that remember that enzyme has a specific shape. And so this, this um, drug, uh, interferes with reverse transcriptase. If reverse transcriptase doesn't work right, then can the HIV virus inject DNA into you? No, into your bacteria cell, can it make new viruses? No. And so what has happened is they've slowed the pro uh, process from when somebody is infected with HIV to when they come down with AIDS there's a lot more time in between that process because people are taking these antiviral drugs, which is slowing the process of the spread of the HIV virus to various cells, and therefore slows down the weakening of the immune system, which then allows them to survive longer without any symptoms, so they can be infected. So now they've, they've got a whole host of drugs that work in different ways to stop this from happening, and so people can live a, quite a long time being infected with HIV without developing AIDS, all right? And so, so that's how that works um, with that. So that's a uh, kind of, This, long, this section here, I'm just gonna kind of talk a little bit about it. Notice that there's not a lot of fill in the blanks. I started to make them fill in the blanks and I thought, you know what, I'll just talk about it. Um, <laughs> so some viruses um, damage or kill cells by triggering the release of um, enzymes. Hydrolytic means from hydrolysis, it breaks down things from um, lysosomes. So this right here, these things right here are talking about why we get sick from viruses. Remember the virus really technically isn't really trying to make us sick, they're trying to reproduce 
more viruses, but that we can get some side effects. Some um, cause the effect itself to produce toxins. Others, we have um, the envelope around them. We actually have an adverse reaction to. Um, and depending upon the virus, uh, our, our repair um, can happen fast. Like when you get a cold virus, it affects your upper respiratory system, but you get rid of that fairly quickly. But something like polio is a virus that attacks your nerve cells and causes permanent damage with your nerve cells. What it does is make it so your nerve cells can't communicate with your muscle cells, the muscle cells can't contract, and therefore people are paralyzed with um, polio. And that's irreversible. So depending upon the virus, um, the ultimate damage uh, can be very severe to minor. Um, and a lot of, I think Lucas, you said this yesterday, a lot of our symptoms of viral infections, like if you uh, uh, are, think of the flu and so on, are due to our body's reaction to the virus and trying to fight off the virus, so like a fever and so on. Um, I'm sorry, let's talk about the immune system. I just wanted to point out, again, vaccines. I just added in here to, we've already talked about vaccines in this class, but I added it in here again. Um, and that vaccines have been wildly successful. Um, remember, it, you're given a either weakened or dead version of the virus, or we do this with bacteria as well. What it does is allow your body to make memory cells against them so you can have a faster attack the next time you see them. Vaccination has pretty much eradicated smallpox, um, so we've gotten rid of our, our, our vastly, in some of these other cases, vastly reduced um, the number of cases of uh, viral diseases. So this gives you some examples of those. Um, obviously some viruses we don't have effective vaccines and some viruses like the flu virus we talked about yesterday we have to make new vaccines all the time because they are constantly mutating and um, I just added this because I thought it was interesting uh, how things change over time um, so there was an influenza pandemic from 1918 to 1919 that actually killed more people from the flu than all of World War One all right, people dying from the flu. Um, and so and it was a more to uh, total people, proportionally more people died of the influenza in that single year than the four years that people died of the Black, uh, uh, black Death, or they call it the bubonic plague. You guys heard of that, bubonic plague? Um, and so people think of that, ooh, the bubonic plague, but, um, but uh, proportionately more people have actually died of the influenza um, as well. So, so now we don't, ha uh, we don't have very many people dying of influenza. Um, we have medical, better medical treatment um, and we now have vaccines as well. Um, and so and this part I've already kind of talked about here. So uh, antibiotics don't work against viruses. Uh, this just says there's the AZT with the HIV production interfering with um, reverse transcriptase and so on, and so we can get antiviral drugs. So that's the best um, attack against um, viral diseases. All right. Uh, there are uh, in in our past uh, have been. Um, new viral diseases that emerge, um, meaning that there seem to be nobody has this viral disease, and then all of a sudden, ooh, there's a new viral disease coming out. So that was the case for AIDS um, back in the early 80s, um, uh, where there was a lot of people coming down with um, AIDS and so on, and doing research, they found that um, was went back maybe to the, the 50s, um, but became an epidemic in the 80s. Uh, but that was an emerging disease then. Um, the influenza virus is constantly mutating, so we constantly have new uh, strains of flu, and then people continually get sick with, from that. Ebola virus um, in Central Africa since 1976, and so um, that was an emerging, emerging disease then. West Nile virus. Um, came into North America in 1999. When it says here, appeared for the first time in North America, does, that means that for this continent, but there was in other places of the world. Um, we find that now things spread so much quicker because people do international travel um, and so on, and so, so diseases spread a lot quicker. And then there's SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, is a, um, can be very deadly, uh, upper respiratory, um, uh, 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 caused by a virus that um, about 2003 um, was one of those recent, it was about 2003 that it became 
an epidemic. And, um, uh, and one that people are concerned about now, especially for pregnant women, is what? It's the Zika virus, all right? And so, um, and so I'm gonna, I'll talk, I wanna make sure and get through this. I have a short little video on the Zika virus, but I might not get to it till tomorrow because um, I want to get through what we need to eat. All right, so let's talk about how and why we get new viral diseases. So the first thing is existing viruses can mutate. So this is like the flu. Some mutations create new viral strains different enough from earlier strains that they can affect individuals who had acquired immunity to these earlier strains. So, so getting the flu vaccine last year may not work against a new flu strain. Um, also, the spread of existing viruses from one host species to another. So, so that can be because of contact. Um, so it's estimated that about three quarters of all of our um, human diseases originated in another animal, right? And so, and, and remember that, that viruses, all they need is the right receptors to bind with your, your, your cells. And it could be that, you know, um, organisms that didn't transfer um, from one, organ, one species to another because maybe the species didn't come into contact with one another. So um, you have somebody going out into the rainforest studying something, they come into contact with a lot of things that maybe they hadn't had come into contact with before and a, a virus can, they can obtain the virus and then they go and go back to their town and then they can spread it to people in their town and then somebody travels to Europe and now it's in Europe and so on and so forth. So it can spread that way. Well, remember you have to have a gene to allow it to do that. So like, and that's random the, due to a mutation. Like they can't go, ooh, you know, let's keep our you know, host alive. Um, and so, so you have to have a mutation occur that would cause a trait that would allow, you know what I mean? So that, so maybe it, that might happen. But it just hasn't happened yet, all right? All right, so, so um, like the antivirus started in mice, all right? Um, they think that the, they're not sure about that severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, I was just talking about. Um, but uh, it, the first cases were in China, and they think maybe it was due to um, uh, the exotic animal trade market and so on, them coming into contact with the animals and then transferred from animal to human and then spread that way. And they, ship the animals to all over the world and then it spreads that way as well and so on, all right? <coughs> um, the third thing is the spread of existing viruses from a small isolated population to a widespread epidemic. So sometimes it can be isolated, but now then some, so it could be in a small population, but nowadays, you know, people visit that small uh, population, it used to be that People lived in a little tribe, in a little small population, and so they'd stay there and they didn't come into contact with much, uh, many other people before. But now people are traveling, going, going to places, um, and so on, and so therefore things can spread a lot quickly, a lot quicker that way. So, um, so AIDS went unnamed and virtually unnoticed for decades before spreading around the world. Um, what helps to spread around the world? Um, People are sexually promiscuous, and so that some diseases can spread that way. Um, drug abuse from IVs and sharing needles and getting cross-contamination there. Blood transfusions and just international travel and people moving around um, and so on. So all those things can lead to um, the spread of viruses. And, um, and especially these things like um, uh, the uh, unprotected sex and... Uh, and drug use 
uh, and so on is really prevalent in third world countries where people don't have the education. There are countries still to this day that there are people that don't know that if you share a needle that there are these microscopic things that can go from one person to another and affect you and transfer that. There's, there are people in the world that don't know that, so there's some lack of education there. Where would um, the reemergence of uh, viruses come from? Because I know nowadays measles and mumps are becoming more and more prevalent in westernized society just because uh, people aren't getting vaccinated anymore. Um, and I'm, it's kind of hard to understand why. And then also, like, I think you've lost herd immunity or so, uh, it's a term oh. called, yeah, that like less than 95% of the American population is immune to these viruses now, and so that's created an issue with that. Yeah, because what happens when people are vaccinated doesn't get rid of either the virus or the bacteria that causes the disease. So it's still in the natural world, but because you're vaccinated, you have the memory cells to fight against it. So you may come across the, a virus, you know, that normally would cause measles or whatever. Um, and so, so, you, but you don't get it. So then somebody next to you that, not literally, um, <laughs> but somebody else um, that wasn't vaccinated, they in the natural world can come across those same viruses. So the, so the viruses aren't eliminated off the face of the earth. And, and, Does that and, make sense? Yeah, and can't for some of those viruses, if a human gets infected with it, they can then infect other humans with it, even if they're vaccinated. I know that, yes, that happen. yeah, with, with measles has happened a lot with uh, in Disney World and, and stuff. Yeah. You ride oh, next to someone who has it, and, yeah. 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 because you think it causes autism or something. All right, you guys. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about now bacteria. Bacteria is the second thing uh, that we're going to look at that we're going to apply to our DNA technology. So we've already talked a lot about uh, bacteria when we looked at just prokaryotic cells itself. So some of this is new, some of it's just a review. So um, bacteria, remember, are single celled. They have one double-stranded circular piece of DNA. They have one chromosome. Um, to give you an idea, just, just a few stats here. Um, has only about 4,400 4, genes. Um, that is 100 times less than a virus and 1,000 times more than a eukaryote. So, so it has kind of in-between viruses and eukaryotes. Now the thing about bacteria is that in addition to that one circular big DNA chromosome, they have small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. These plasmids only have a few genes on them, so two to a dozen or so. And so if we draw a picture of what that looks like, if this is the bacteria, the bacteria has one big circular chromosome. So this is its big chromosome. And it has multiple plasmids. Multiple plasmids that are, are small circular pieces of DNA. And, and, and those plasmids, the genes can make proteins to give that particular bacteria certain traits. So in the 50s, um, some Japanese physicians started, that's when they first started noticing that some bacteria are resistant to our antibiotics. So in further study, what they found is that the bacteria that are resistant, that resistant gene was not part of the big bacteria's chromosome. That resistant gene was a gene on one of these plasmids. And so, so, so this gene was actually a part of this plasmid. And they called this plasmid the R plasmid. Why do you think R? R stands for resistance. And so the genes for resistance are carried by plasmids, specifically the R plasmid, where R equals resistance. Some of these genes code for enzymes that destroy antibiotics. Example, ampicillin. Ampicillin is a type of antibiotic. We're going to use ampicillin in our lab which is why I chose this as an example. So what happens is, is the, this right here, this green, makes it ampicillin resistant. 
So any bacteria that has this R plasmid, if you try to kill it with ampicillin, this will live. Um, so then any bacteria that do not have it, so here's a bacteria with the big circular chromosome, it has, still has plasmids, but none of the plasmids have the resistant gene, ampicillin will kill these guys off. And so how originally did a bacteria get this ampicillin resistant gene, do you think? Through a random mutation. So for, think about this, years before we even uh, figured out about antibiotics, there were bacteria that maybe had this random mutation that makes it resistant to this molecule that it hasn't even come into contact with. So that mutation is not really hurting or uh, helping the bacteria. Now, when we developed antibiotics and you had a bacteria infection, when you take antibiotics, what you're doing is changing the bacteria's environment. You're putting a new chemical in their environment. Now, all of a sudden, that gene to make it ampicillin resistant is really beneficial um, for the bacteria. And it's, uh, so the, the bacteria that don't have it, they die off and then these guys live. And this helps for the survival of the species because this one is going to divide and reproduce and make more resistant uh, uh, bacteria and so on. And so this just um, uh, brings home the point that genetic diversity and having differences in the gene is helpful for the survival of the organism as in the ampicillin resistance. Hand sanitizer not good for, well, when they talk about- blanketly, yeah. Yeah, because when it says it's like, it kills like 99.99% of bacteria, that 0.001% that's left is, you know, probably now resistant and it's going to keep reproducing yeah. on your hands, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so just wash them, don't use hand sanitizer. That's right, just it's better water. just to use regular soap um, with no, Antibacterial. And in the long run. Okay? You're right. You're right. Well, what, what organized? Somebody, what, a club or something? Right? Right? They say that, and then some, some guys' bathrooms don't even have hand dispensers. People rip them off of the walls. Yeah, yeah like this one down here doesn't have them. I learned that there's doesn't only have... one stall in the bathroom that has a door. Like, yeah. Yeah, you, um, you like you you use but a stall. But the stall was telling me all about the boys' bathroom. Oh, the You use a stall, oh, and you like go number two, and you can't wash your hands with soap. And like, <laughs> what do you do? I mean. That was oh, way too scripted. I don't know what the time That's like a third world country. I mean. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's finish this up. So, through natural selection, the fraction. That conversation was recorded. Through natural selection. <laughs> A bacteria with genes for resistance increases in a population exposed to antibiotics. So, so when it, so all the bacteria that don't have the genes um, are going to be killed. So, what we have is more and more antibiotic resistant bacteria becoming more and more common with the use of antibiotics, and so there's a real concern, a health concern for that. So some other things about bacteria, they divide by binary fission, which means that they just divide and make identical copies of themselves. So these two right here, when they divide by, um, they, uh, these two are identical. And so when they reproduce, there's no genetic diversity from reproduction. So they're, they're genetically identical. And unlike us, when we reproduce due to crossing over and the way the chromosomes line up, our kids are different than one another, they're different than you, um, and so on. That's not true for bacteria. As we talked about yesterday, they proliferate or divide very rapidly. You can get millions and millions in a single day. So um, under optimal laboratory conditions, meaning um, right temperature, right food for the, they can divide every 20 minutes and you can get 10 to the seventh to 10 to the eighth bacteria in as little as 12 hours. Um, relating this to us, we have good bacteria that live in our colon, our large intestine, and um, they produce some vitamins for us and so on, so they're good bacteria. 
Um, so they grow a little bit more slowly and they develop every 12 hours. Um, and so we, but we have to rapidly, we do re replace those because our colon is where our feces, our solid waste moves through. When it's moving through the colon, it strips some of that bacteria and some of that bacteria leaves through your solid waste. So your solid waste will have some bacteria on it. So then your colon, those bacteria have to divide to replace them. <laughs> Most bacteria in a colony are genetically identical to the parent cell. Um, but there are mutations as well. Let me talk about that. Let me talk about what a colony of bacteria is. You need to know this for the lab that we're gonna be doing. So bacteria, we're gonna grow bacteria on a Petri dish. The Petri dish in the bottom has auger in it that the bacteria grows on, but the auger has food for the bacteria to survive on. And so, so what happens is when you put bacteria, when we grow bacteria, you cannot see right away the bacteria. You can't see an individual bacteria, they're too small. So I'm gonna have a solution of bacteria and it's just gonna be a clear solution. You can't see the individual bacteria. What you're gonna do is put this, Roman, put this clear solution on the um, uh, Petri dish and you're gonna spread it around. You can't see any of the bacteria, but the bacteria will be on there. So let's say these dots are individual bacteria. So then what we're gonna do is put it in the incubator so the, they'll have, have be nice and warm and they'll have food and so they'll be very happy bacteria and they'll divide very rapidly. So then by the next day, when you come in, you will see, you won't see individual bacteria, but you'll see big circles like this where the bacteria were. This is called a colony of bacteria. That colony has millions of bacteria in it. And each one of these colonies started from one single bacteria cell. So right here, there was one bacteria cell. It started dividing, 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 dividing. And by 24 hours, now you have millions. While you can't see one individual bacteria, you can see a whole clump of millions of them. So you will see millions of bacteria. Each one of these are considered a different colony made from a different bacteria. And they're all clones of one another. It says that there can be mutations as well. It could be that one of these randomly mutated, but most of them will be genetically identical. All right, and this is where we're gonna stop. Uh, your homework. Uh, uh, we're gonna do an activity tomorrow um, that you need to watch this video for. The video, I gave this for homework last year as well. So on my YouTube channel, if you can write this down, this is the date it's under. And it's in two parts, part one and part two. One is 13 minutes long, one is 18 minutes long, so it's a total. Right? So you need that for two. And it's the chapter 20.